Hello and you're welcome to the Backdoor Hurling Show. I'd like to be joined by former Kilkenny Hurler and James Stevens Hurler, Owen Larkin. Um, I suppose firstly, Owen, how have you found the last few months? Yeah, um, it's tough I suppose. It's tough on everyone, but uh, look, you just have to keep doing the right things and um, keep following public health advice and you know try and go as much as you can for walks and exercise and things and keep the mind right. Yeah, and before we came on air there, they obviously had um, a season hampered by injuries this year with James Stevens. Will you be looking to go back now for another year? Or, uh, do you, is it over for you as a cover? Yeah, I think it's probably over for me uh, at the moment. Um, I've taken over Ballon Hill now to manage them, so I'm going to give that 100%. Um, and look, when the season finishes, then if, if Kilkenny Championship is still is still going and um, and the lads are still the lads are still in the championship. I might think about you know going back for the couple of weeks then, but I think you know <laughs> my career is just just about done now. And has management been something you've always thought about for quite a while? Yeah, well, for I suppose since I finished hurling with Kenny, has been something that's been on my mind for a while, um, and that's basically why I got involved with the under 19s in in the club there for the last couple of years. Um, you know, I suppose you always stay, want to stay involved when you're playing days, finishing the natural progression then is to go into coaching and management. And, you know, it has been on my mind since since I retired with Kenny, I suppose. And you kind of have to say, like, the ex-players that you've all played with, you seem to love management. David Herity, Michael Fenley, Henry Shefflin, um, now he's going into management as well with a new club in Kilkenny. So you're all just mad for management. Yeah, well, like I said, it's just a natural progression. You know, hurling has probably been part of our lives for so long and um, we want to stay involved. And obviously, once you get that bit older, the body doesn't let you stay involved in the playing capacity, but certainly management is is the next step. And like you said, there's there's been a lot of lads um, that have gone into management in the last, you know, a couple of years. And uh, Henry going, going back in with Thomastown this year as well. So, um Look, there's there's loads of us out there, and it'll be probably hard to get a job, you know, <laughs> in the coming years with with another few lads coming on board. But look, um, it's a natural progression, I think. And some lads are into the media side of things. Some lads are into coaching and management, and you know, it's just it's down to your own preference, really. And my preference would always be, you know, to get that buzz of match day and and training with the lads, and you know, that's that's just my pre- preference. I suppose if we get into your um, Kilkenny career, um, 2005 to 2016, eight All Ireland's like, so within your 11 years, um, you only missed out on three All, all, all Ireland's like. You must look back at that career with unbelievable satisfaction. Yeah, I do. Uh, and I suppose it's hard when you're in the midst of it to kind of realise what's going on and you think it's, you know, this is just the way it's supposed to be. But when you retire and you look back and, and like you say, you, you've you won eight all Ireland over 12 years, it's it's just phenomenal. It's, you know, it's it's kind of dream stuff and stuff that you would dream about when you're growing up, but don't think it's ever going to happen, you know, and you think you're going to maybe win one or two all Ireland's. And um, when you do think back on it, you think back of the, the players that you played with and, and the teams that you played with and, you know, obviously the manager that you were under for the, for those 12 years. And all you can have is kind of all you can have is satisfaction, really, and and joy when you're thinking about it. Because you know, not too many players look back. Although over the last number of years, there is a couple of players that can look back and have had a better career than what I have had. But you know, when you look when you look down to, um, I suppose the big hurling counties of Limerick and Tipperary and things like that, and you and you see lads with only one and two All Irelands, it's it, it sounds a bit crazy to. That you have eight. And like, what kind of work was required, like, to win eight All Ireland's? Like, it must have just been so much. Yeah, well, I suppose it's the same for everybody. You know, we didn't do any more or any less than any of the other teams. I suppose we just we just came came at the right time that we had, you know, a brilliant team and a brilliant manager over us, and you know. When I say a team, I mean, you know, 30 lads kind of pushing each other or 35 lads pushing each other every night in training. And, and you know, we we obviously done gym work and 
we've done fitness work and you know skills work and all that but it wouldn't have been anything um it wouldn't have been anything that what anybody else was doing you know we're we're definitely looking for that edge to to get us over the line but you know i think being an intercounty hurler now requires requires you to do that work and if you don't do that work you know you have no place being in, in an intercounty setup um but we, we didn't we weren't flogged in the physical side of things mcdempsey had it down to a t um he had his very very fit um, but he also had his very, very fresh for game days, and I think that's hugely important too. And Brian Cody, like over here for all of them years, like they often say in the dressing room, you need to change the voice, but this didn't happen in Kilkenny. Like, how did he keep this hunger going within the side every year? Well, I think his, his own hunger, you know, it never, never waned, and he was always hungry for for the next year. And once January came. He forgot beforehand, or or we hadn't. He didn't. He wasn't going on past wins. You had to earn your spot that year, and if you didn't earn your spot, he'd he'd replace you with somebody else. And you know, I think it came. The hunger came from the top down, um, and you know, he was true to true to his word, and you knew that. So if you were kind of living on past victories or past performances. You wouldn't be in the in the panel or in the team too long. So, and everybody knew that. And, and I suppose when you listen to Brian Cody, um, what he does is he requires standards, and um, he doesn't go below those standards. And those standards are usually standards of excellence. And if if you're not require if you're not getting to those standards, well, then you don't meet meet the required uh, criteria. And Obviously, you'd be let go of the, uh, off the team, and then if if they continue to drop off the panel, so uh, you knew you always had to be at the top of your game, and that, I think that drove players on to get the very best out of themselves on the training field. Would you say your secret just the change every year? One or two lads coming in. We've seen Walter Walsh, TJ Reid coming in. All these players, but like we've seen teams struggle not winning all Ireland's. Um, you probably have to look at Galway's two in a row from not changing the team as much. Would you say that was the main factor in Kilkenny to change every year? Uh, I would say it probably helped. I wouldn't say it was the main factor. I'd say the main factor was probably that you know lads actually drove themselves on harder the following year, um, and that might sound hard to do, but when you when you have um, a decent panel and a very good panel that. Maybe the thirty lads, any of the thirty lads could start, and you see it in training week in week out that they're really driving to get a, a starting place, and you feel under pressure for your place every night. Um, I think that's what really drove it on, and I think that's what makes a great team and a great panel, and made us a great team and a great panel was the fifteen lads that weren't playing uh, in championship days, driving us really driving us on and. Um, probably we we'll probably face probably some of our toughest tasks in training rather than the matches um, through that period from probably 2006 to 2011 and that's really what what made the difference I think. The A versus B games in Kilkenny there's something often talked about is it true that Brian Cody just blows the whistle and lets he go at it? Well for from from I suppose 2006 to 2009 or 10, yeah, that was probably it. But I think they were kind of blown out of proportion in in the sense that, um, you know, Brian didn't blow the whistle, but he he would have always been shouting no foul and no foul and I think, um, we I think we used the stop foul. We used the foul an awful lot, but they were very intense games. They were very heated games, but we tried. We tried to the best of our ability not to foul and keep the ball in play as much as possible. Um, and I think, like, it wasn't it wasn't going out to war or anything that you know we were slapping the heads off each other or things like that. I think it was pure tough hurling, and uh, I think that's that's what really set us up for for the couple of years that we had. I suppose. Going looking now to start the year, you came in in 2005. Like, who would you say was the biggest influence when you came in 
to the Kilkenny senior panel because it can often be a daunting task coming into your first senior inter-county panel? Well, I suppose the biggest influence I had when I was going in there was PJ Carey because he was my hero growing up. Um, I idolised everything he'd done on a hurling field and to get the chance to go in and sit down beside him in the dressing room and ultimately play with him that season was, you know, it was a dream come true. I felt like pinching myself at some stages, but um, definitely uh, he played a big part in kind of influence, influencing me to try and push myself to get better and better. And uh, and then as the years went on, I suppose it changed, it changed a bit. I suppose James McGarry had a huge influence in, in, in my career uh, going forward. I used to always kind of go in, train nearly, and James McGarry would be always out on the field and you know you'd be pucking pucking around crossing back and but he used to be just constantly looking for more out of me you know speed up the hurling speed up the drills speed up the hit of the ball your touch all that kind of stuff and you know i'd i'd be nearly wrecked kind of before training started but it definitely improved uh, my ability to be quick on the ball and you know get rid of the ball quickly and my touch improved an awful lot over that period of time. And like you mentioned DJ, one of your heroes, is it hard to get back down to earth when you walk in as a young lad and you're playing with your hero? Uh, not really, no, because when you go out into the field then um, and, you know, lads are kind of hopping off you and want to take your place and things like that, it's very easy to get back down to earth. Um, that only lasts a couple of minutes once you walk into the dressing room and you sit down and get your get your stuff on. But once you get onto the field, it's it's time to get down, knuckle down and, and get to work. And um, if you're not working out in the field, you're let know by the other players and by management fairly quickly. And pre-season, like back then compared to now, did you find it difficult to adjust to at the start? Yeah, I found it very difficult. I, I, I wasn't uh, one that loved pre-season um, I liked the off season and you know the way it used to kind of pile up a bit and coming towards the end of the career then you kind of just keep taking over um, because you don't want you don't want to have to go through the punishment that you have gone through for for years and years but um, it, it definitely was tough and I didn't like it but it's just a part and parcel of it that you, and you have to get through it. And then four in a row uh, when you come in and you're new to the panel like. How special was that? What did it take to do four in a row? Yeah, it was unbelievable. At the time, I suppose we didn't realise what it was. It was just the next all Ireland, the next all Ireland, the next all Ireland, the next game. That's all we wanted to do. But it was it was hugely special. But I think, like I said to you before, it just took 30 or 35 lads really pushing each other to the very, very limit. I don't think we would have got there if we hadn't had the strong the strong panel that we had. Um, like if we only had the bare 15 um, and the team picked itself every week, we would never have got there. We would have never won probably one all Ireland, let alone two and definitely let alone four. Um, and I think it was just it was just a time that we had 30 to 35 brilliant, brilliant hurlers, but like obviously only 15 could play. But they, every night they went out, they were pushing to get a starting place and ultimately that was pushing us to the to, to pin our collars and, and to work really hard uh, to stay in the team. 2010 comes then, you're looking to go for five in a row, you come up against um, your local rivals Tipperary, Larry Corbett gets his hat-trick, um, was that really tough to take? Yeah it was hugely tough to take, um, obviously there was a bit of a circus down around Kilkenny for in the weeks beforehand with Henry and John Tennyson coming back from cruciate injuries and things like that. And I think probably uh, we probably took our eye off the ball a small bit. Um, but we also had another injury. Brian Hogan uh, broke his finger in a couple of places a couple of nights before the, that final. And I, I always kind of say that Brian was probably, he was probably more of a loss to us than Henry was because he was in such a pivotal position. Um, I think, I don't know, did anybody really expect Henry to get through the 70 minutes, but um, but Brian was definitely a huge loss to us. Um, now, that's not taking anything away from Tipperary, they were superb on the day, but the game was very, very down to the last kind of 
seven or eight minutes, I think. So, um, and then obviously Tipperary got a couple of goals to pull away, and it looked like we were, no, we were struggling for long periods in the in the game, but we were still there. We were still plugging away, um, but once they got the goals, that that was kind of the end of it. And you know, after it was very hard to take because. Um, you sit back and you think, you know, will you ever get the chance to do five in a row again? And the answer is, is always going to be no. And did you use that hurt massively that winter um, as Kilkenny Irish? Absolutely, yeah. Um, we had nothing on our minds. Uh, we went on holidays early that year and we came back and we started training earlier than we'd normally start. Um, and nothing was on our minds when we get in Tipperary in the All Ireland final. And anybody that tells you any different is a liar. Um, because we spoke about numerous oh, we'd be having a few pints on holidays, and over the Christmas, we'd be having a few pints together and things like that. We spoke about, and all we spoke about was getting Tipperary in the All Ireland final. And, you know, lucky enough for us, the following year, we did get in the All Ireland final, and we were never going to be beaten in the All Ireland. Would that have been back then where you'd have your newspapers, your articles about Kilkenny, or sorry, about Tipperary winning that all Ireland, would they feature in the dressing room to get you motivated or would the motivation come within the players? No, the motivation definitely came within the players. It was not never brought into the dressing room. And it, it, it couldn't be, I don't think, because, you know, like we weren't just landing in an all Ireland final. We still had to prepare properly to get there. Um, and we had a couple of matches, you know, three or four matches to get there. And um, obviously we had to take them with the, with the utmost serious seriousness and respect that they deserve. And we did, you know, and if we didn't, we wouldn't have got to the all Ireland. But, you know, ultimately at the back of our minds, Tipperary were at the back of our minds. But we knew we had a process to get through first and um, we had to win all our games um, to get to an all Ireland final. And, you know, if Tipperary were going to be there, that was going to be brilliant. But, you know, we had to start from the very start and take everything in our stride. And how special is that rivalry with Tip? Yeah, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. And I think, you know, people kind of fall down to hatred and things like that because, you know, supporters and things like that get carried away, I think. But, like, we had the utmost respect for Tip Tipperary and the horrors that were there. And we, we always knew that we had to be at the top of our game to beat them. And I think that's that's a kind of a mutual respect there as well. I think the Tipperary fellas felt the same way as well. You know, they had to be at the top of their game to to, to beat us as well. And and I think that's where that's what brought out the best games um, between ourselves and Tipperary over the over that period of time. You know, we, we knew we had to be mentally and physically in the best shape of our lives um, to topple the other end. That's that's why there were so, such good games, I think. And like, if you're up in, I suppose now, like the psychology possession game, do you think back to when you were playing, how how much the game has evolved? Like, it's just such a change, I suppose, to when you were playing compared to now. Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, when I was playing as well, it probably evolved every year. And every year it was getting more and more technical, you know, the, Stats were getting more, uh, more and more. The video analysis was more and more. Um, you know, the GPS is introduced. You know, it just I think year on year it just keeps going and going and going. And people and people are trying to find an edge, and that's what it is. You know, if if you can get an edge on another team, um, then you know the percentages go to you, um, and that's what it is. And you know, next year it'll be the very very same. Someone will come up with something different to try and get the edge. But like from the time I started to the time I finished to now, it's it's been a huge, a huge, huge change. And you know, sometimes I do be thinking to myself, would I be able to would I be able to live in the modern um intercounty scene intercounty scene with all the fitness required? But I, I think, you know, if you're young and and you're fit and, and well and injury free, I think you just adapt. And a lot of people have mentioned recently that the air to defending has gone out of this uh, current game, like compared to when you were playing, would you agree? Um, I'm not sure what I agree that the air to defending has gone out of it, but certainly the reading of the game seems to be gone out of it. Um, you don't need to be re able to read the game as much um, to be a, a, a decent inter-county hurler because 
like it's it's nearly gone into a possession game, running game, um, and you know nobody really hits the ball that far anymore. So, uh, so I think that, that side of it gone over to a certain extent. I still think you know the art of defending is when when your opponent gets the ball and he's running at you, you need to defend that, and and, and that's a, that's a key thing. And not many people or defenders around the place or around the country are able to do that. You know, you'd often see forwards getting the ball and just running around their man and hitting it over the bar or, or hitting the back of the net. But I think, you know, there, there is certain defenders that are brilliant at that. And like we, in our team, we had we had loads of lads that were brilliant at that. JJ Lady was absolutely brilliant at that. Noel Hickey was brilliant at that. Um, but you'd have to say, you certainly need that art of defending in the modern game. You mentioned some of the defenders you played with there, uh, Jackie Terrell, Noel Hickey, JJ Delaney, Tommy Walsh. Would like making them players in training obviously had you so ready for any battle you were going to encounter in a match? Absolutely, yeah. Look, they were some of the best hurlers ever, ever to play the game. And, you know, when you're marking those lads constantly in training, you, can, you can't do anything but improve. Um, and if, if, you do, if you're not willing to kind of pit yourselves against the best and and try and improve, well, then you have no business being in an inter-county team. Um, but definitely, do I think my game improved overall from, from Mark and those lads? Absolutely. I don't think I would have been, or I, w- I would have lasted as long in the Kilkenny setup if I wasn't doing that. And then in midfield, um, James Charles Fitzpatrick was there for a few years. Would you feel like within Kilkenny that he was a hugely underrated hurling? Uh, no, I don't think he was underrated. I think people knew how good he was. Um, but there were certain sides to, to Chad that, you know, probably let him down in some in some aspects. Um, I know in 2011, I think it was, it was last year, he, he really knuckled down and gave everything. But there was other sides to him that, you know, he wasn't really, really 100% committed to being the very, very best he could be. Um, he probably dispute that back, but um, I think there was there was much more to to be got from than than we actually got. And I think him looking back, maybe I don't know would he would he agree with me or not. But I certainly believe there was much more to be got from from Chad if he had to really, really, really push himself to get there. Then um, two thousand and twelve. You play goal in the Leinster final, the Beachy, they win your first Bob O'Keefe. But the first day um, against Galway, you were obviously playing up front. But like during that game, did you just look at Henry Shefflin and say, this is a Henry Shefflin masterclass because he was literally unbelievable that day? Yeah, he was brilliant. But I don't think when you're in the heat of battle, you have time to be, um, time to be saying, Jesus, thank God for Henry Shefflin. He's... He's unbelievable. But when you do look back on things, um, it, it was unbelievable the way he just took the game by the scruff of the neck because like most of us were struggling all over the all over the field and he just he just thrown out the attitude that he just refused to be beaten that day and um, and he very nearly won it on his own for us to be fair. Um, Joe Kenny only kind of got free in the last minute to, to equalise it but like when you look back on those displays, it's 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 brilliant to look back on, but it's disappointing that you know the team didn't perform that day either. Um, and I don't know, it's hard to explain that year because when when Galway beat us in the in the Leinster final, obviously we didn't turn up at all, and Galway were brilliant. But it kind of I don't know, did it put a bit of fear into us that we weren't able to really express ourselves for the rest of the year? Um, and it was hard, and it kind of. It was kind of nearly a hangover then into 2013 as well that that happened, that kept going like that. But um, it was it was a weird, it was a weird kind of a feeling. Um, you know, we really wanted to play well, but just didn't seem to be able to get the performances out of it. And what did you do different? Like, you drew a guy that you, you were needed an expert at replays. What did you massively change between the replay? I think just our... our our minds, you know, we, we really tried to focus in our minds. We knew we had the hard work done. We knew we had the hurler. We knew we had the hurlers uh, to win. But I think we needed to 
we need to just relax and, and change our mindset. And I think we've done that. And probably Brian probably played a lot into that by by bringing Walter in for the replay and kind of freshening things up slightly. Um, and you know, I think that's all we did really did need was just our minds to be a little bit fresher. Um, and you know, it obviously worked. Yeah, and when you draw a game like you obviously have everything planned for after the All Ireland. Is it kind of tough, kind of day or two, to to get yourself ready again because you've had stuff organised after an All Ireland final? Yeah, I suppose it was tough that evening going back to the city west and getting the getting the food and things like that. Um, it was it was tough because you know all your family uh, have things organised up there and they're staying up for the night and the next thing we're getting on a bus and going home. But after the, the, that night is over, I think it's very easy. You know, I probably have a meeting on the Monday night after training and, and speak about how things went and go through video analysis and stats and things like that. And and once once you get to that meeting, then I think, you know, your mind is is really focused on uh, putting in a hard three weeks of training and then and getting the very best of yourself of yourself for, for the replay. And that's just what we done, you know. We just had to kind of let go of everything outside the camp and, and let family and, and friends and things like that look after all that kind of stuff and just concentrate on, on training for the next three weeks and, and ultimately getting a good performance out on, on, in the replay. And tactically, like Brian Cody, just unbelievable. Like you mentioned, he puts Walter corner forward, targets to go away defence. Um, he knows Johnny Cohen's a small man, goes in and puts Walter on. Like, it's just some operator to be able to pick them things out um, after, I suppose, lads doing well, but he knows that he can pinpoint this. Yeah, it is. But like when, when lads talk about Walter um, being thrown in at the deep end, Walter wasn't thrown in at the deep end. He'd been hurling very, very well and working very, very hard for a number of weeks and, and maybe months before that. So Brian knew he was ready for the battle. Uh, and but to everyone outside, it was it was a big kind of a it was a big gamble, if you like. But you know, like everybody on the team knew what Walter was doing for the past number of weeks and knew that he was up to up to the job. So we had, we had great confidence going in that Walter would do a good job for us. You know, be it for forty or fifty or or seventy minutes. You know, we we had great confidence there, and um, you know, but like Brian is there to to make those decisions too, and. Um, he feels it's the right thing to do for the, for the team, and you know he doesn't he doesn't hesitate to make the calls. And TJ Reid, um, we often hear this um, that he thought about leaving the inter county setup, but <laughs> like he's literally carried Kilkenny out of games probably uh, later on in the last decade. But what do you feel he changed between? I suppose only coming on to really nail in his position in the Kilkenny team. Yeah, well, when TJ came in at first, you know, we all seen the skill he had and you know what he could do with the ball in his hand. But I think over the probably from probably from when he thought about walking away and and Henry had that chat with him, I think he's changed his his attitude towards um, physical training and work rate and things like that. You know, he always had the skill. You know, his, his physique has changed, his fitness has changed. He works an awful lot harder off the ball, as we seen last Saturday, you know, for Colin Finley's goal, or Billy Ryan's goal, I think, maybe. And, um, you know, he flicked the ball from Owen O'Donnell. You know, TJ Reid of probably 2012 or 20, 2013 probably wouldn't have done that. You know, he probably wouldn't have chased down his man like that. And, you know, I think that's the big, that's the big change in TJ Reid of the last probably six or seven that he's he's willing to to put his body on the line for the team and and really really grind out work um, for the team and you know I've seen him over the last number of years in the club scene here as well and the amount of work that he gets through um, in in sixty minutes is is kind of crazy you know. So, and two thousand and fourteen Hawkeye introduced uh, the famous Bob Bubbles O'Dwyer's opportunity. Would you say that's the best game of hurling you've been involved in? Um, <coughs> probably, probably was. Um, you know, it was a fantastic game. But two thousand and nine was a great game as well. 
I think 2010 was probably a great game up to the last 10 minutes as well. Um, 2011, again, you know, I think probably just the Kenny Tipperary rivalry, um, like I said earlier on, just brings out the best in, in, in teams. But definitely 2014 was was right up there um, as, as one of the best, I think, yeah. And um, you you mentioned in your autobiography that you went through a bit of depression. Was that was that very tough? I suppose during your career. Yeah, well, well it was, but at the, when during my career, I didn't even realise that it was depression. Uh, but I just kind of, I was just kind of plodding along through through my career and didn't realise why I was thinking like this or why I was feeling like this and. Um, you know, it, it's it's a hard one to explain because when you don't know what's what's wrong or um, or you don't know why you're feeling the way you're feeling, it's very hard to to make a diagnosis yourself. And you know, you're not going to go into a doctor. Well, I certainly wasn't going to go into a doctor and say, you know, I'm I'm feeling like this and I'm thinking about this. And um, it was only really when I couldn't take it anymore that you know I had to. I know and up and, and and go to the doctor and say, look, I'm feeling like this and and you know I'm thinking about this a lot. Um, he was able to tell me or he was able to diagnose me that I had depression. You know, I always thought of depression as something that I I would never get. You know that people, other people get and uh, the fella down the road gets. I would never think it's it, it's just a big bombshell to be able to. Um, to have to sit back and realise that, geez, you do have depression here, and um, and once you do that, I think the the weight becomes lifted off your shoulders, and you become a different person, really. And how do you feel you got over that? Well, first of all, I was able to get a, di- get a diagnosis of the doctor, and I was able to accept it, and I think that's the biggest thing. Once you accept it, you can move on with your life, and you can. You can deal with anything that comes uh, down the line, and you often hear people when they when they're after getting diagnosed with cancer, you know, they, they just refuse to accept that that they have cancer. But once they accept it, then and um, you know they start the treatment, they start to get better, and they start to start to fight against it, and um, and and that's and that's really what it's like, and it's it's hard to it's a hard one to explain that they actually get, go through it. Um, but I think once you accept it is the time that you you start to come out the other side and, and, and you start to heal. And you mentioned obviously in the book that um, Brian Cody and the Kilkenny doctor helped you massively through that period. But is this something you feel that is going on in inter-county setups with some players that mightn't be being addressed enough? Yeah, I do. I do. I definitely think... Um, I definitely think it needs to be addressed, and I think people need to be honest. Um, but the hard, I think that is the hardest part that maybe people don't even realise that what it is, um, because they, you know, they're thinking, Asher, this, I'm, this is only going through my mind or things like that. But and it's hard for other people then to to see or to or to talk to people if they don't know either, um, and. You know, I, I don't know how do you address it because it's probably different with everybody. Everybody probably feels a small bit different or is thinking about different things. But it was just, I suppose, with me, it was my body language on, on the hurling field the previous night that Brian knew there was something wrong with me. Up to that, I, I'm not sure did he ever realise there was anything wrong with me. But, um, but it was just that one instance that, you know, my body language was wrong on the field. Um, I obviously knew I wasn't feeling great, but he wouldn't have only for my body language. And and you know, he he just as the as the Kilkenny manager and I was part of the panel at the time, he picked up the, the phone and just and just rang me and you know wanted to know was I alright. Um, and and sometimes that's all it can take is someone to pick up the phone and say, Look, you didn't see you didn't really see yourself last night, is everything okay? Or, you know, do you want to talk about it? and or you know, is ratting I can do for you. And maybe that's all it needs, you know, if you see that, you know, someone is really not, is not themselves for uh, the night before or the day before or the week before, 
all it can take is, you know, someone to say, you know, they want to talk to, talk about anything. And then, you know, in my case, I burst out crying. Um, and then I obviously knew there was something wrong with me and Brian obviously knew there was something wrong with me. So um, the logical thing to do would be go to the doctor then. But it doesn't seem logical unless you go to the extreme um, uh, and you burst out crying on the phone to bring Cody and that would be the extreme. But it can be different for other people, you know, other people who say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm really not, I'm just not feeling great. I don't feel sick or anything. I'm just, I'm just not feeling great. And then, you know, if, if you said it to me, I could say, well, look, why don't you go to the doctor and just tell him that? And, and that can be the start of it then. And, you know, you can, you can start to move on then. And, but I think, you know, it's, it's just about keeping an eye if people are not being themselves for a day maybe or, or a week or, or a couple of hours. You know, just to ask that question, look, they are right, you're, you're not your set there for the, for the last couple of days. And all about other things, like when you're retiring from your career, how much work goes into them? A uh, huge amount. I didn't, I didn't realise the amount of work would go into them. In fairness, um, Pat Noel and Don Mine, obviously, but um, he put in a huge, huge amount of work into it. Probably more, more work than I ever put into it. And um, I probably had the easiest part of sitting down and he was asking me questions. Um, but like the amount of um, research that he would have done and all that kind of stuff would, would be crazy, you know. And it's it's funny because when he's asking you questions, like all the years kind of roll into one and say, no, that definitely happened in 2014. And he said, no, I think it happened in 2012. No, it definitely happened in 2014. And he'd go back and do the research and he'd be actually right. Um, so it's 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 tough, like what Pat would have put in an awful lot of work. But in saying that, like Pat would have come down to my house um, for probably three or four hours, twice or three times a week for maybe nine months or twelve months. Um, so there's there's a lot of time involved in it. Um, but look, when the, when the finished product comes out, then and you're happy with it, you know it's something to be proud of as well. And is it tough as well, like because you're a former player and you don't want to give too much away about the setup either? Yeah, well, look, you have to. If you're going to do one, you have to be kind of honest and, and open about it. Um, and, you know, don't, there's not really that many secrets, to be, to be honest, in the Clayhenny setup. You know, I think with what lads tell the media and interviews and things like that, and, you know, there's no secret to it. It's just, it's straightforward stuff. But like I said earlier on, Brian just sets standards and there are standards of excellence and he accepts not less. And that's really the secret. Um, so, like, when you're when you're going to do it, you have to be honest, um, and people have to accept that, I suppose. And I suppose um, your best day in the Kilkenny New Jersey. What would you say that that is? Um, on the field, or my, probably the most memorable day I have in the Kilkenny New Jersey is obviously going up the steps to the Hogan stand as captain. Um, um, as playing, I'm not too sure. Probably, probably 2008 All Ireland, maybe. Um, but uh, maybe 2015 as well, because uh, I had a broken thumb and I was able and play. I was able to get through the game and play particularly okay, I suppose as well. That probably stands out as well. You mentioned your thumb. Like, how much pain were you in that day, Blair? I wasn't in actually any pain during the game. Um, I I got an injection on the on the Friday night before before the All Ireland, and I went out onto the field and I was training and I was I was in agony training. And I said, "How am I going to get through a match here on Sunday with this pain?" And I don't know how Ty Crowley gave me um, on on the Sunday, but it definitely worked because I wasn't in a bit of pain throughout the match. But once the match finished. My thumb swelled up unbelievable and I was in agony with it for the rest of the night now. Uh, the alcohol probably killed off <laughs> a small bit at that night, but um, for the rest of the for the rest of the week I was in agony with it. And I went back in Tuesday and got the got the cast back on. And um the biggest setback in your career, Kirky Kenny. Uh, the biggest setback. Um 
Jeez, I'm not sure. Uh, the biggest setback is probably. Uh, it was probably 2010, I suppose. Um, that that kind of, I know it hit us as a team hard, but it hit me particularly hard because um, I probably wasn't feeling great at the time, and you know I was probably um, losses were probably exa- exacerbated. Um, so probably 2010 All Ireland probably hit me. Probably was the biggest setback I'd say. And the uh, top three Kilkenny hurlers you played with? Um, it's hard. To, it's hard to pick to, to top three. Definitely DJ would have been up there. Henry, and I would say probably Tommy Welsh um, would probably probably be the top three. And who would you say was your toughest opponent um, you played against? Um, probably. Sh- Probably Shawnee McMahon, I would say, from Clare. Um, prob- I think I only, I only played against him a couple of times, but my God, he was his reading of the game was unreal. He had a great hand, and he was strong as an ox as well. And probably in 2005 or six, I was probably only a slight lad. I hadn't a whole lot of weights behind me at that stage, so that made it probably harder. And... You actually started off your underage career as a goalkeeper, if I'm not wrong. Like, was it tough going from goalkeeper to outfield? Yeah, well, I didn't really. I, I had played in goal um, kind of a grade above above mine. I was always outfield at my grade, but um, the grade above me hadn't got a goalie and they asked me to stand in goal. So I actually I, I played in goal for a couple of years and uh, right up to right up to minor at the club, and uh, we were playing a league final, and I actually dropped the ball into the net, and we got back in the league final, and that was the end of my goalkeeping career. And um, St. Kieran's College, obviously, just Kilkenny culture, Kilkenny DNA. Does that get you ready for the Kilkenny setup, really? Um, yeah, yeah, no, it probably does. If you stay there for the six years, you're supposed to be there, but. Um, I only stayed there three years. I left after my junior cert, so um, I was I was probably Hurland was probably a, kind of in the middle of uh, wasn't at the bottom of my list. Is probably in, in in the middle of my list at that stage. I was kind of take or leave Hurland at that stage of my life. And uh, um, but I but I'm sure when you talk to other lads um, and they're on the senior colleges team and. In uh, St. Kieran's, it definitely does um, get you ready to, to go into the county setup. Then, obviously, you played in inter provincial series. Do you think they should still be in existence? I actually really enjoyed playing it because you were, you know, you were mixing for, with, with lads from other teams and things like that. And um, it was great to kind of get together and, and get a team. Um, from different counties together, I think they, they probably weren't given enough respect over the years I played in them. You know, they were shown on probably in November and things like this, and the end of October, and uh, there wasn't really much crowds. Uh, but I always really enjoyed it, and I felt if they if they could get a, a good date in the calendar, um, that they they would have they would have kind of blossomed. But they they never seemed to. It was always kind of end of year things and. Um, and then you had lads that were still in club action; uh, they couldn't commit to it. Um, so there was always something kind of holding it back uh, that they couldn't really give it a hundred percent. And I think that's why it suffered. But I always enjoyed playing it. I, I, I kind of I loved playing it, and you know I loved the the buzz of it. And would you have fond memories from the All Star trips um, abroad? Yeah, we always a good crack at them. Um, it was always, and the only kind of, I suppose the only down downside to those All Star trips is they weren't that long. You know, they were only probably a week long. Um, I think it would have been brilliant if if you could go away for for two weeks with lads from other counties and you could really get to know them and become friendly um, with them. But we like we made them awesome. Don't get me wrong. Um, we had we had great times on them as well, and um, we had great crack, and it was great to see. You know the characters of the other teams, um, and the way they they kind of 
the way they behave on on All Star tours and things like that. It was it was it was good fun though, to be fair. And um, then James Stevens, um, in two thousand and four county final, you come up against DJ Carey's club, you get over the line, but dramatically win the Leinster final that year against UCD. Yeah, yeah. Um, I suppose we would have been happy just winning the county title that year. I think it was 23 years since we had won a county title, so it was nearly kind of, it was nearly a famine in the club at that stage, and we were just delighted to go over the line. And um, and then, you know, once we go over Kil- Kilmessen, it be, kind of became serious that we could go on to the Leinster final and actually win the Leinster final. So, um, you know, once we got to the Leinster final, we knew UCD were going to be a good team and we knew we'd have to be at the top of our game. And, you know, we were at the start. You know, we took took a kind of command and lead into half time and probably probably thought the game was over, but the UCD came back as. And, but, like, I think I think the run in the Kilkenny Championship probably stood to us because we were after being behind um, against the Lachlans in the semi-final the first day and came back and got a draw you know and I think that was probably a turning point in in, in our year um, and in our mentality that you know we were never bet and you know we just kind of hung in in the second half and we hung in and you know I think UCD could have got back level um, coming towards the end and you know we just were able to kind of get a ball down to Devin McCormack and I think he, he tapped over a nice score and we held out for, for the victory but um, I think that was that was probably one of our best wins the, that year. And then you get over the line again, that's right, in the All-Ireland Club final. But like, I don't think people actually know how special it is to win an All-Ireland Club title with people you've grown up with walking up the steps of the Hogan stand until you actually experience it, really, is it? No, it's not. Uh, you have to experience things like that. And- even at the time, I suppose I was I was very young. I probably didn't really even appreciate it as much as I should have. And I often think, well, not often, but I've looked back on the video a couple of times, and like your heart just fills up with joy looking at it now. Whereas back then, I'm looking at myself on the telly and I'm saying, why aren't you enjoying this back then as much as you should be? And it's because I was so young and I thought this was going to last forever, um, and I thought. You know, we have a great team, it's it's young enough, we have some great experienced lads on it, but it, it doesn't work that way, you know. And probably two or three, probably two years after that, that team broke up, you know, and we were never we were never the same again. Um and obviously never got back to that stage again. And that's that's the disappointing part. But like it's great to be able to look back on it and say you done it and um have the memories from it, but um, I don't think you really appreciate as much when you're young. Older lads did because they were coming towards the end of their career, but I had a full career ahead of me. Yeah, and I suppose currently now, Barry Hale, the juggernaut um, of the Kilkenny Championship, so close this year for yourselves. Chad Plunkett, obviously, overly, Connor Brown, Luke Scanlon, great young girl who's coming through. But how tough is it going to be to try and stop Kilkenny like because we're even seeing the young players now that are coming through Owen Cody, Adrian Mullins like they just keep being able to produce these earlys. Yeah it's, it's going to be very difficult to, to, to do but on the other side of that if, if you can go Kilkenny I think um, there's a great chance for, for anybody uh, going on to the All-Ireland there because I've always said that Kilkenny is the toughest championship to win. There's probably there's probably ten out of twelve teams that can win it any year, and um, even the other two teams could knock one of the one of the favourites out. You know, so really, probably twelve teams could win it, um, and it's it's probably the most difficult championship to win uh, around the country. And and I always feel if you can go with Kilkenny, you have a great chance of winning the All Ireland. And this current system, club before county, you're obviously going into club management. Do you feel it's the way to go? Yeah, absolutely. I think it has to be, well, maybe, you know, not so much club before county, maybe county before club, but I think it needs to be a split season. Um, like, it's it's a total disaster getting teams back to play one or two matches in April and then one match maybe in July and then not until October or September. 
You know, I think it's crazy stuff. And I think you know, we're probably suing inter-county managers as well that, you know, you have a set date, you know, this is when you're starting, this is when you're finishing. Um, but I think it definitely needs for, for the for the club game going forward, I think it needs a split season and it needs a start date and a finish date. And I think there's no two ways about it. Would you have found it hard in your playing career, like juggling between club and county, going back for a bit and then yeah. kind of mixing it? Fit, no, no I'm, prob- I'm probably on the other side of it now. But to be fair, when I was hurling with the, with the county, I actually enjoyed going back to the club uh, and getting a week or two with him. But like when you're on the other side of it, you see it from the club player, player point of view that you know they're trailing away here for nothing for two games, and put and maybe one in July and one in September. Whereas the inter county, when you go back to the inter county, then you have a, a mountain of games to get through, and the club players are just left sitting there playing in the meaningless games. Um, Throughout that period of time, and really, until it's 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 really not fair on the club player. Um, obviously, when I was playing with the county, you know, it didn't really bother me. But I see it. I see it from the other side of the coin now. Um, I suppose when you finished with Kilkenny, is it very hard that year after being the supporting? Yeah, definitely is. The the year you finish, it's very hard to motivate yourself to go. And sit in the stand and watch Kilkenny. Uh, or, well, it was for me anyway, but um, I think as time goes by and you start kind of living your life a small bit again, and um, do the normal things that normal people do, and then you know you start to enjoy it that bit more. And you know, you can be able to go to the pub for a few pints and watch a match, maybe, and, and then ultimately get to the get to the stadium and watch it. And, um, and that's when the enjoyment comes back, I think. And Kilkenny obviously coming up last year in the Ireland and final. Um, but do you still feel there's a bit of an over reliance on TJ Reid in this Kilkenny team? Yeah, absolutely. Probably TJ and Colin um, are probably a bit over reliant on the two of them. Um, and saying that, you know, it's a young team, they're inexperienced, it will take time. You know, like Rome wasn't built in a day, but, um, you know, this will be probably their second or third year. Uh, no, so you know they need to be kind of they need to be learning that bit faster and um, and obviously the, like the the game against Dublin last week won't won't have helped them any any bit. Well, it probably have helped Brian because he'll be able to say, look, you know we can't do that. We have to focus our minds for seventy minutes and, and things like that. But look, as I said, they're a young group of players. Probably TJ is probably the oldest of the lot. Um, and but they need to be stepping up very quick because I'd worry um, if that hadn't happened to TJ Reid or Colin Finley, I'd worry for Kilkenny. Is it disappointing seeing your teammate Richie Hogan struggling with injuries so much when I suppose like early on the last decade he was hurt of the year, he was hurling out of his skin, but just struggling with fitness the last few years? Yeah, it is. It, it is very disappointing and it's, it's, it's tough to watch because you know, I know he puts everything into it, um, and even for the club this year, um, like he had to come off in I don't know how many matches. He didn't start in a couple of matches because of the injuries, and you know, you just wonder would he be better off just taking a break from it and try and get get his back right and maybe come back next year um, fully fit? Because you know, he seems to be taking it easy um, in the league and that kind of stuff, but. It doesn't seem to be getting any better when he comes back in the championship. You know he's still struggling, and um, so so you just wonder would he be better off taking a full break from it and, and trying to you know trying to get a hundred percent before he does come back. But it, it's disappointing to see because he is such a fantastic hurler and he's he'd be a huge player for Kilkenny fully fit, um, but it's not to be at the moment. And do you feel Limerick are a step ahead of the rest of the pecking order? Uh, I feel like they're about three or four steps ahead of the rest of the pecking order. And I, I, to be fair, I felt they were last year as well. And I think Kilkenny caught them cold. Um, I, I, I didn't see Kilkenny beating Limerick last year. In fairness, Limerick were a bit off, but Kilkenny were superb on the day. Um, you know, everything went right for him. Everything went well for him. And just a few little things went wrong for Limerick. 
but I can't see him being caught again this year. They, they've got the kick up in the backside they needed from last year, I think. I just can't see him being beaten. Their panel is too good. Um, like there's the Pat Ryan came on uh, last week, David Reedy came on, uh, Seamus Flanagan, you know, all these lads have, have came on and, and they've, they've made a huge difference when they've came on, come on, you know. And like last week, they didn't need the difference, but they will at some stage. And, you know, when you have that quality of players to come on and make a difference, you're in a serious, serious uh, position. And just briefly now, you were um, involved with the Defence Forces for a while, and um, you're not anymore, but did it give you a huge perspective on life being in Syria? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you know, when you're, when you're out there and you see what's going on and you see the way children are growing up and, uh, you know, all the schools closed, there's very little children on the streets. It's, it really, really hits home how lucky we are to, to live in a country like like Ireland that, you know, you can get up in the morning, you can go to work, you can send your kids to school without any worries and things like that. And, um, you know, it really, it really does make you more appreciative of what you have at home. Absolutely. Well, thanks a million for your time, Owen Ekin.